Welcome to lecture 4 of our course Rethinking History. In this lecture we will discuss history and identity. Let's start with a picture in which we will see people protesting against changes in history textbooks as proposed by the Texas State Board of Education. Don't mess with textbooks, don't poison our history and kids need education not indoctrination. What should children learn in school about history? Well, that's a question that stirred debate for decades and we can find examples all over the world. Sometimes the discussion and protests are violent, such as in West Virginia in 1974. Schools were hit by dynamite and coal mines were shut down. But why is school history so contested and a topic of fierce public debates? Well, opinions about school history's purposes are related to ideas of meaning and engage with identity, citizenship and group formation. History is not only a narrative about the past, but also a narrative about the present. This is visible in text and in debates about history but also in museums, for example. This is America's Black Holocaust Museum, founded in 1984. The founders asked for more attention for slavery and they used the term Holocaust. This means that we directly think about World War II and the mass destruction of mostly Jews by the Nazis. Some think that the atrocities of the Holocaust or Shoah are unique, but other people intentionally use the word Holocaust in the museum about slavery to show the severity of this atrocity. And we saw the same in 2001 when the Twin Towers were attacked. In a cartoon we see the 9-11 Holocaust. So when we talk about history and identity, the stories about what have happened, Historia Rerum Cristarum, are very important. The psychologist Jeroen Brunner argued that people tell stories all the time in order to construct meaning about themselves, the world that surrounds them and the past. And by linking the past, the present and the future, stories can add significance to these three time dimensions. So people and communities shape their identity in a reconstruction of the past from their vision of the present and with a view to the future. The study of other cultures' pasts involves the construction of a personal and collective identity and that means drawing boundaries. Who are we? And by mentioning features, people are trying to distinguish themselves from the other. So they are trying to define who belongs to the in-group versus those who are seen as being part of the out-group. Identity is established by attribution, socialization and internalization. Attribution means that the other attributes an identity to you. For example, when I'm on a history conference in another country, people often ask me, are you Dutch? And the first time I said, yes, but how do you know? And they said, well, you are a tall woman. So they attributed an identity to me based on my height. And in this case, it was correct. I am born in the Netherlands. I was raised in the Netherlands and I still live and work in the Netherlands. Another way of establishing an identity is by learning through education, socialization. So perhaps you are not born in the Netherlands, but by going to a Dutch university and by learning things about the Netherlands and the Dutch way of life, you can establish a certain Dutch identity. But the formation of identity through education is especially visible in primary and secondary schools. With young children who are introduced to 
traditions and the history of the nation, for example. A final form is internalization, that is acquiring an identity. For example, after the 2015 terrorist attack on Charlie Hebdo, I am Charlie, je suis Charlie, became a unifying slogan of free speech. Individuals can have various personal identities, for example related to their age, class, gender, ethnicity, education or sport. And it is important to understand that people can have several collective identities as well. Now I have a question for you about the Dutch and tulips. How would you characterize this identity? Is it attribution, socialization or internalization? Well, originally tulips were cultivated in the Ottoman Empire, present-day Turkey. Tulips were imported into Holland in the 16th century and they became extremely popular and in the mid-17th century, tulips were so popular that they created the first economic bubble, known as tulip mania. At the height of the bubble, tulips were sold for 10,000 guilders, so you could buy a really nice house with that amount of money in that time. Tulips are still very popular in the Netherlands and are even celebrated in festivals. So on the one hand, this is internalization of a certain identity. Dutch people almost think that they invented the tulip and that it, that it is really Dutch, but it isn't. So this is internalization. At the same time, nowadays, this identity is also attributed to the Dutch people by others. For us, as historians, it is also important to historicize the term identity. I mean, in the Middle Ages and in early modern history, the term identity as we know it did not exist. People had positions in society that were given to them by God, such as farmers and nobles. So people had a nature, a character or a self. And political authority also came from God. So in this fixed society with ranks and classes, you could not just change your rank, for example. But this changed in modern times. Emphasis was placed on becoming who you are, ways of being. So a dynamic and plural approach became leading. It was the idea of creating and making identities and improving yourself and society. Identity as an answer to the question, who am I? The term personal or social identity emerges in the 20th century and was influenced by the new science of psychology. In the next video, I will tell you more about people's changed relationship with the past and the social frameworks in which people narrate and remember the past. See you in video 2.